Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, and he has a lot of teaching that he's loading into these last few moments. And Jesus said to his disciples then and says to us today, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and will reveal myself to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus is about ready to leave his disciples, and he knew what was in store for them. Persecution, imprisonment, martyrdom. Jesus also knew what they needed most, the assurance that things were going to be okay. He says, I'm leaving you with a little gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you isn't fragile like the peace of the world. So don't be troubled and don't be afraid. Problems are a part of life. Roofs leak. Cars don't start. People get mad. Feelings get hurt. We feel rejected and unappreciated. We're sick and tired. Well, a wise person once said, sometimes we get the gold mine. Sometimes we get the shaft. Very wise. For successful living is having such an inner peace that we can manage whatever comes. Do you know the story of the speed skater Dan Jansen? He was a favorite in the Calgary Olympics. But just before he was to race, news reached him that his sister Jane's uh, long battle with leukemia was over. And Jansen said, when I got on the ice for the race, I felt wobbly, like I hadn't skated in six months. Jane is dead. Should I be here? How can my parents stand in that audience and root for me while they prepare to bury their child? Unable to concentrate, Jansen had a terrible Olympics. His poor performance was compounded by his guilt. And in spite of his history of winning championships in other venues, Jansen choked at the Olympics. At the next Olympics, the last event for Dan to skate in was the 1,000 meter race. Dan had never won this race before, but he knew it was his last chance to win a gold medal. Approaching the starting line, he touched the ring around his neck, containing the birthstone of his eight-month-old daughter named Jane. Once more, in a major race, Dan Jansen slipped. But this time, he didn't fall. When he crossed the finish line, the crowd noise was deafening. Years of intense training, four trips to the Olympics, five humiliating falls, and Dan Jansen finally won a gold medal. The victory was won on the ice only after it was won in his heart and his mind. 
Jesus wasn't worried about the obstacles his disciples would face and are now facing. Jesus was concerned about hearts and minds, the inner strength and discipline Christians need for what's coming. Jesus promised them that even though he must leave them physically, he would not leave them spiritually. The Holy Spirit would give Jesus' followers courage and comfort for difficult days. Think of the courage that the early followers of Jesus needed. They would be crucified upside down. They would be torn apart by lions in the gladiator pits. They would be burned as human torches at Nero's garden parties. They were martyred because they would not renounce their faith in Jesus. James Moore, in his book, Standing on the Promises or Sitting in the Premises, tells about an American visiting Damascus, Syria. Now, this was long before Civil War broke out. The American went into the marketplace on the street called Straight. It's the same street that's mentioned in the book of Acts. The marketplace was crowded teeming with merchants and shoppers and tourists. And a man on a bicycle slowly wound through the crowd, balancing a basket of oranges on the handlebars. He was bumped accidentally by a porter who was weighed down so much by the burden on his back that he didn't see the bicyclist. The burden dropped off the back. The oranges scattered all across the way, and a bitter altercation broke out between the porter and the cyclist. So what happens? A crowd gathers. Oh, don't look so surprised. We do the same thing, don't we? Traffic slows down in the lanes that have no obstruction just because everybody's looking over, trying to see what, what happened in the other lanes. We do that. This crowd gathered because they, they were certain there was going to be a fight to watch. The enraged cyclist moves towards the, the porter with his fist clenched. Just then, a small little man walks out and gets between the cyclist and the porter. He reached out and took the cyclist's clenched fist and kissed each one. A murmur swept over the crowd. Then they laughed and then applauded. The antagonists relaxed and then hugged one another. And then everybody got down on their hands and knees and looked for oranges that were scattered all over the place. The little man just got back into the crowd and was moving off. And the American followed him and said, what a brave thing you did. It was wonderful, but why did you do it? Why did you put yourself at such risk? To which the little man smiled. Because I am a Christian. The spirit of Christ was in me and gave me the courage to be a peacemaker. The spirit gave me the courage to do the right thing. Courage is a rare commodity in our world. The followers of Jesus gained their courage from the presence of Christ's Spirit within them. That's good news for us. There are times when you and I need to be courageous, to stand up for what is good, what is right, what is lasting. The year was 1887. A music professor by the name of A.J. Showalter received some bad news. Two of his former students were now widowers. 
Both men were in despair and had contacted their old music teacher in a desperate way to find some comfort. Showalter had always been deeply devoted to his students, but he had no words for these two men. So he turned to scripture, where he found this verse in Deuteronomy 33. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Professor Showalter wrote a chorus and sent it to his students. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Jesus did not tell his followers they would have no problems. No preacher of the gospel would ever say that. In fact, if you ever hear a preacher of the gospel say that you become a Christian and you will have no problems, you turn off that television set or turn off that radio or you get up and get out of that sanctuary because that person is not preaching the gospel. That's not what Jesus promised. Jesus promised to his disciples then in the upper room and to us today promises the gift of the Holy Spirit to give courage and strength. Christians are to be strong, courageous warriors, not worriers. I must admit, this is the pot calling the kettle. I majored in worry and got an A in it. I do it very, very well. And perhaps you've come to this house of worship today seeking the assurance that everything will be okay. Well, I can give that assurance because I'm learning to lean on the everlasting arms of God. And I want to save you some of that worry because you don't have to worry. Not like I do. Not like I'm trying not to do. You can lean on the everlasting 